right, we're going to begin on chapter 26, Psychiatric Emergencies. Um, most most of our calls in EMS, uh, or the majority of them, will be a psych call. A psych call. Um, today's overview is psychiatric problems and emergencies, dealing with psychiatric emergencies and legal considerations. All right, our case study, EMTs um, respond to assist law enforcement with a person hallucinating. When they arrive, they find a 26-year-old man who is terrified, agitated, and screaming, Help me! Get them off! Get these spiders off of me! How should the EMTs approach this patient, and what should they say? Next question, what are some potential causes of the patient's behavior? So, uh, I encourage you to, to write these things down. Um, if you have the opportunity right now, write your answers down, and uh, later on we'll uh, you will see um, as the lesson progresses how these answers uh, the answers will come and I'll go back just to give you uh, a second to review the introduction so that you can see if there's uh, any details you might want to write down as well so uh, some key topics really quick though are uh, hallucinating um, obviously he's um, in his 20s pretty young He's terrified, agitated, screaming, uh, help me, help me, uh, get them off, get those spiders off of me. So uh, some things to consider as you are developing answers in your brain. All right. You cannot uh, always see a psychiatric issue. The care you give patients with behavioral emergencies can save lives just as the care you provide for physical problems does. Your assessment is important for the continuing care of the patient. Um. A psychiatric disorder is an abnormal mental condition. A psychiatric emergency is behavior that is unacceptable or intolerable to, intolerable to the patient or someone else, uh, such as abnormal behavior. Um, are they a threat to themselves or others? And they can show a rapid change in cognition. Are behavioral changes psychiatric or physical? Uh, behavioral changes uh, have many causes. Always consider that an apparent behavioral problem may have a physical cause, like a traumatic injury, uh, maybe a brain injury or, um, or something of that nature. All right, some uh, medical conditions that commonly produce psychiatric problems. Um, e uh, Pre-hospital care uh, uses um, mendamine as a mnemonic, uh, metabolic, electrical, nutritional, drugs, toxins, arterial, mechanical, infection, neoplastic, and degenerative, and I'll go back, but that is the mnemonic, um, and we see that there can be electrolytes, Cushing's disease, epilepsy, temporal lobe seizures, thiamine folate, uh, folate deficiency, anemia, street and or medical drugs, stroke or TIA, which is a transient ischemic attack, uh, brain injury, subdural and epidural hematomas, HIV, syphilis, meningitis, and hep C, uh, primary or metastatic tumor, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Creutzfeldt, Jacob disease, and multiple cirrhosis. Those are common medical conditions that produce psych psychiatric symptoms. Um, as you're assessing a patient, you always want to do your mental status exam, and that, and that, that would be with anyone, but especially if you suspect a psychiatric emergency. Um, so look for their general appearance and demeanor. How, how are they grooming themselves? Are there, are they, their hair, is their hair wild and ungroomed, uh, especially in females? Um, men, you'll see that they, they, maybe there's the beginning of a beard. Um, they haven't shaved. Um, look at their build. Are they, um, are they really skinny? Have they eaten? You can tell someone is malnourished and then check their behavior. And we're going to go over some of those things in just a second. Um, during the assessment, pay attention to the following speech issues, speech pattern. Uh, when they talk to you, do they change their pattern? Is it, um, are they stuttering? Are they changing the subject? Um, and such, are they slurring their speech? Um, are they making the appropriate responses when you ask them a question? Is their speech pressured? 
Like, do you, do you have to keep asking a question over and over and over again to get an answer? Look at their skin color, temperature, and condition, their posture or their gait, uh, how they walk, how they hold themselves. Uh, look for unusual movements, orientation, person, place, and time. Uh, do they know who they are, who you are, uh, who the people are around them? Do they know where they're at? Do they know what time it is during the day? Is it morning, afternoon? They don't have to know the specific time. Um, is it daylight, dark? Do they know the year, the month, the day? That's Those are important uh, questions to ask. The memory. Uh, can the patient recall events? Um, think of a major event that's going on or that happened recently, and you can ask them about that. Uh, do they have the ability to think abstractly? Uh, are they aware of their surroundings? Their body language. Body language. Uh, threatening gestures or expressions. Dystonia or tardive dyskinesia are both. Um, dystonia is uh, involuntary flexing of the muscles. And tardive dyskinesia is where... Uh, Someone is uh, has involuntary movement, okay? Um, so you might call it a tweaker or something like that, but that's not going to be the case. It's going to be d dystonia or tardive dyskinesia. Um, perception and thought content. Are their thoughts organized? Are they having delusions? Are they hallucinating? Are there any phobias? Um, un, unusual phobias. I mean, some, a lot of people have phobias, but are there un, unusual phobias? Um, do they have rapid shifts in topics? Uh, repeated words. Those are all kind of things you need to, um, be looking for in perception and thought content. Their mood and affect. Uh, it's not affect. We're here. We want to, we want to use the word affect because this is how they're going to, um, interact with you and how you'll interact with them is it a normal mood are they angry is there euphoria or irritability um, do they have a restricted or flat effect like when you're talking to them are they just looking away not really paying attention to you are they paying attention to you but they're not talking to you they won't respond to you and are there rapid shifts in emotion? Their judgment is it rash? Do they have rational decision making? Like, um, if you if you ask a normal patient, "Hey, um, you're sick, uh, and we really think you need to go to the hospital and get checked out," and that patient says, "You're right, something's wrong." Um, irrational would be, um, "Sir, I believe you're having a heart attack, but we're not for sure. We need to take you to the hospital." And the patient responds to you, if I die, I die. That's irrational. Um, do they have insight? Do they understand what you're telling them? Can they comprehend it? Um, indications that cause uh, that the cause is physical. So here's some clues that may make you believe that they're That their psychiatric responses are, are, are a result of a physical um, change or uh, tra tra traumatic incident. Um, if there's a sudden onset of symptoms, um, usually psych patients with chemical imbalance have um, prolonged signs and symptoms. This has been going on for a while. Uh, memory loss or impairment. Pupillary changes. Uh, excessive salivation incontinence of the urine or of the bowel unusual odors on the breath um, could be um, some acidosis going on um, as far as memory loss or impairment memory loss we could they could be experiencing some retrograde or anterior grade uh, amnesia um, so we need to do a physical exam even though we think they're a psych patient and get a history Always get a history. Always do a physical exam on your patient. When you get out into the world where you are um, doing this job on a daily basis, these are two things you're going to have to do every time. 
Um, so these can help determine whether the patient's condition is psychiatric in nature. Um, a patient who experiences uh, his first psychotic break might begin hallucinating uh, or having delusions resulting from decompensation. So um, when our body decompensates, um, we know when it compensates, um, it's it's trying to help it's trying to help keep keep us alive, and then finally. It, it just can't do it anymore and it starts decompensating so we we can see people um in decompensation having a psychiatric emergency uh anxiety disorders uh anxiety is a state of uneasiness about impending problems it's characterized by agitation and restlessness a panic attack is a discrete period of intense fear or discomfort uh you or someone you know may have had panic attacks before or you or someone you know may be suffering with anxiety um, a phobia is an irrational fear triggered by a specific object or event. Um, some people have phobias of spiders. Um, some people have uh, pho a phobia of uh, being in small small spaces. That's claustrophobia. Um, you may have a phobia. Uh, so there's things to consider. You know, these things are real. Um, bipolar disorder. Changes in mood from very high to very low. Uh, manic phase involves abnormally elevated, expansive, or irritable mood. Um, and elevated mood alternates with periods of normal or depressed mood. Depression. Feelings of sadness, worthlessness, discouragement. Uh, it's a factor in suicides. There's a flat effect, withdrawal, and crying. Changes in appetite or sleeping, feelings of guilt and indecision. Neurocognitive disorders uh, replaces the term dementia. So we're, we're, we're kind of talking about dementia here. Um, agitated delirium is a neurocognitive, dis a neurocognitive disorder and physiological response. It can be associated with drug use. A patient can suffer a sudden cardiac arrest. Um, a patient is typically violent and a potential danger to you and others. So uh, you'll you see agitated delirium. You might you might even hear excited delirium. Um, it's definitely a serious thing. Um, when it first um, when it first came about, policemen were running into to these uh, drug addicts who were on these on uh, high and. They would they would arrest them and they would handcuff them and sometimes had to handcuff their ankles together and they would put them on their stomach you know in the prone to handcuff them and um, didn't didn't realize what, that it was agitated delirium or excited delirium and it, they would put them on their stomach and they were um, suffering cardiac arrest because of their respiratory uh, system was being impended and um, it was there, these people were dying so. Um, it, it's it's crazy you know you have to be careful with these types of people because they can can be very agitated and um def, definitely violent and could hurt you or other people especially themselves uh all right so schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders schizophrenia is a chronic mental illness uh this is a chemical imbalance in the brain uh distortions of speech and thought delusions hallucinations Social withdrawal, catatonic behavior, lack of emotional expressiveness are all part of schizophrenia. Paranoia, uh, exaggerated or unwarranted mistrust and suspicion, delusions of persecution. They may be aloof, hypersensitive, or argumentative. Aloof meaning very, very uh, um, high functioning, so to speak, but in the, men, in, in, in the uh, means of paranoia. Uh, the behavior can be unpredictable and aggressive. Psychosis, the patient is out of touch with reality and the patient lives on it within his own reality. So you, you may be talking to them and they're in their own little world. They have no idea what's going on. Um, it can manifest through delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech or behaviors, and loose associations. Substance abuse and addictive disorders talking about drug and alcohol use an individual's use of drugs and alcohol results in clinically significant impairment and distress common substances of, of abuse include alcohol caffeine cannabis 
hallucinogens, inhalants, opioids, sedatives, hypnotics, an anxiolytics, um, stimulants, and tobacco. Yes, caffeine is in there. Um, if you're like me, I, I like caffeine. I tried to stay off of caffeine for a day, and I was a completely uh, and totally different person. <laughs> By the end of the day, end of the day, I was ready to um, either drink a cup of coffee or get a soda or um, sink off into my own little world and where nobody was, where I didn't want to have any contact with the outside world, and it was it was pretty rough, you know. You, there you, you you tell people they can quit cold turkey sometimes and it's uh easier said than done all right trauma and stressor related disorders a trauma is defined as a deeply distressing or disturbing experience we're talking about uh people who've experienced um some um witnessing a death or divorce or death of a child or loved one um our, our our men and women who are fighting for our freedom uh coming and experiencing traumatic events um so uh but it says anyone has the potential to experience trauma including emt so you, you don't have to be um overseas fighting a war to experience trauma um trauma uh that is not dealt with is, with appropriately has the potential to develop ptsd and i want to say this to you as students um in reference to ptsd um the job can definitely cause PTSD if you are if you experience some traumatic event, which is very very likely with the, and very soon within your career. Um, and if you don't talk to someone um, and not, not necessarily get help, um, it's it, there's no shame in seeing a professional that that is unbiased that will listen to you and give you some suggestions on how to deal with. Um, what the what you experience and how to process it um nothing wrong with that at all doesn't mean you're crazy okay it's just a form of help because once it develops into ptsd um it could be it could it could uh take a little longer for you to understand how to process it the the thought will never go away the the event that happened will, will you'll never forget it but you'll be able to cope with it and cope with those feelings uh, so it's important that you that you handle that because PTSD is a real thing. Um, it's definitely a, a real, real thing. All right. Um, extrapyramidal symptoms caused by dopamine blockage or depletion in the brain. Um, so dopamine um, is what causes that chemical balance. Um, and if it's blocked, we can uh, start seeing some of these symptoms. Like uh, the motor system causes involuntary muscle movement uh tardive dyskinesia uh sometimes uh symptoms often develop as a result of taking certain psychiatric medications um i, I mean sometimes medications are are great modern medicine is great i'm not knocking it but there are side effects and some people don't experience the side effects and some people do so um you know but but what's more i, I look at it as what's more important What's the major the major health issue? Are we are we going to deal with a little side effect or and 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 and, and curb the psychiatric problem or just forget about the psychiatric problem and because we don't want to deal with the side effects and it's it, you know it, this is one of the reasons why psych psych patients don't take their meds because they don't like the way it makes them feel so and then the next thing you know they're being dealt with on the side of the road by the police because they stripped off all their clothes and ran down the road naked. Okay, um, that's an extreme example, but it's it's happened. Um, there are several medication-induced movement disorders, um, unfortunately. Uh, violence. All right, very important that you pay attention here. I know I'm talking a lot, but suicide. Any willful act designed to end one's life. Uh, let's let's re let's say that again. Any willful act designed to end one's life. At least half of all people who commit suicide attempted it previously. I was a policeman for 12 years, and this is a very, very true statement. Um, people don't just wake up in the morning if they're having suicidal ideations and um, say, okay, and then they go do it. They've at least attempted it somehow or another. Um, there are risk factors and potential signs of impending suicide. Uh, so things we need to look for. 
document statements by suicide attempt patients, suicide notes, and any other evidence of suicide attempts at the scene. Um, we all have these nice little smartphones now. Um, if you need to take a picture of the suicide note, because usually if there's a suicide note and, and you bring your patient to the hospital, you'd want to give that note to the doctor. And so you can take a picture of it um, in your in your patient care reports now. Um, most of them will allow you to take a picture with your tablet um, and upload it into the report itself. But it's a good thing to have so that um, so that you can go back and look at it and reference it as you're writing your report. Now, if you take a picture of it on your personal device, make sure, make sure, make sure you go back and delete it in its entirety, and um, so that there's no risk of you violating HIPAA. I mean it. Immediately after you upload your report, you need to delete that photo from your phone. Um, violence to others. Early signs that a person has lost control and may become violent. Uh, nervous pacing, shouting, threatening people, threatening themselves, um, cursing, throwing objects, clenched teeth or fists. Um, these are all things you need to look at um, because they, they are. They are early signs of that someone's about to get violent with you. Um, and, and if that, you see that there's nothing wrong with saying, Hey, we need to notify the police to come out here because, um, not only can they help you restrain the person, protect you from the person. Um, but they're also a uh, very good witness as to what happened. Um, many assessment for common psychiatric emergencies, the mental status exam can provide you with an indication that you may be dealing with a psychiatric emergency. Your role is not to diagnose, look for imminent risk and assess first for anything that could be life-threatening. Always, we're going to do our primary. Don't ever forget that. And if there's any life-threatening condition, we need, to, uh, we need to treat that in the primary. That doesn't change just because they're a psychiatric patient. Suicidal ideation. Uh, be straightforward and direct. Identify if there is a plan, means to a plan, or and or intent, and question the patient. It's okay to ask the questions. Um, and if they get agitated with you, they just get agitated with you. Um, but, but don't, don't just not ask or not do your assessment. Um, just because you don't want to, um, agitate your patient. Homicidal ideation, uh, assessing for homicidal ideation follows the same formula as for su suicidal ideation. Be alert for early signs of potential violence to others while assessing. Um, so if you're dealing with somebody with homicidal ideations, um, you need to take extra precautionary uh, measures to make sure that um, if you're picking them up from a home, that they've been searched thoroughly for weapons um, by the police. Um, usually if you pick them up from a hospital, the hospital stripped them of all their belongings and put them in some scrubs, um, some paper scrubs so that, um, you know, there's no, no way that they got a weapon or anything like that. But you still need to be cautious and uh, make sure you secure secure them to the stretcher so that they cannot uh, escape because that's the last thing you want is someone escaping your uh, ambulance while it's driving down the road not a good thing um, and ask you still gotta ask questions you know um, it's not gonna be the most pleasant of interviews I'm just gonna be honest with you uh, the need for law enforcement involvement. Contact law enforcement in situations of suicide or homicidal ideation. Uh, law enforcement can force a patient to be transported when necessary. Um, so ap application for emergency admission or pink slip. So there are, um, there's a thing called emergency police committal in Louisiana, especially, um, that we can um, commit someone if they meet certain criteria. Um, especially if, um, they're suicidal, homicidal, um, you can have the police, uh, transport them, uh, if you don't feel safe with them in the back of your ambulance, uh, especially, uh, someone who's homicidal, especially, and suicidal, because they could, they could say goodbye and get out of your ambulance and, or you might have a fight on your hands in the back and, uh, having to pull over and wait for police and such. Um, so if there's nothing, um, where they're going to have to have medical attention and you're, you're okay with them riding with the police because they're not going to need medical attention. I would, I would definitely tell that to the police and say, look, because of our safety, I'd rather them ride with you. 
Um, there are some questions to ask in situations such as these to help determine whether the patient might be a danger to himself or others and whether law enforcement should be called to the scene. And I'm going to be honest with you, law enforcement has really is really good at that. So um, you might want to just have them uh, come out there uh, regardless. Okay, click on the disorder that is characterized by sadness feeling of guilt and worthlessness and loss of interest in pleasurable activities. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and click on it for you, give you a second to develop your answer. All right, you should have chosen B, depression. Depression is characterized by feelings of sadness, hopelessness, guilt, and worthlessness, as well as loss of interest in pleasurable activities. Patients also may have changes in appetite and sleep habits. All right, basic principles uh, dealing with psychiatric emergencies. Every person has limitations. Each person has a right to their feelings. Each person has more ability to cope than they might think. Everyone feels some emotional disturbance when involved in a disaster or when injured. Emotional injury is, a re is as real as physical injury. People who have been through a crisis do not just get better. Cultural differences have spe special meaning in behavioral emergencies. Uh, let's see what they tell us in the notes here. Let me see. If it'll let me click on it, just so we're going to bring up the notes right here. Um, because I'm just going to read the notes real quick. Um, because emotional injury is less visible, it is often treated as being a less real uh, mental health uh, stigmas continue to keep patients from seeking the help that they need for fear of being regarded as a different or inferior. Um, do not expect instantaneous or automatic results. Uh, the patient probably will not realize the extent of the event until long after you leave. You are likely to be the first on scene, and your role is to provide a positive beginning to a long, difficult healing process. Um, the goal is not to provide a solution, but rather to focus on providing comfort and support to help the patient achieve a degree of emotional stabilization. Uh, come to the terms, or excuse me, come to terms with your own feelings as you approach a situation and take the time to understand your patient don't get agitated just because this is the third time you've been out to uh, Joe Smith's house because he's having emotional issues okay yes it may be agitating sometimes but sometimes these people are really sick and they're not just looking for attention all right techniques for treating psychiatric emergency patients approach the patient slowly don't just run up on them because they may be freaking out and you might freak them out even more Engage in active listening. That means looking at them and listening to them. Don't be like doing a bunch of other things. Hey, have your partner get the bag out, get the monitor ready, and uh, whatever needs to get done while you are listening to your patient. Um, be supportive and empathetic and limit interruptions in the interview. Um, other techniques. Speak in a calm, reassuring voice. Maintain a comfortable distance. Seek the patient's cooperation. Maintain good eye contact. Do not make any quick movements. You just don't want to frighten them or, or, or think, make them think that you're going to, you know, do something to them because they're taking it all in. They're taking it all in like, like a lot. It's, it's just way more. They're paying attention way more than you and I would even imagine. Uh, so any quick movements might frighten them or startle them. Um, Respond honestly to patient questions. Don't lie to them. Please don't lie to them. Because, they, they, like I said earlier, you are, you are the beginning, uh, a positive beginning to a long, um, long time solution to their problem. So don't make it a negative thing for them because you lied to them. Never threaten or argue with the patient. We should never with that, we should never do that with any patient. Never lie to them. Uh, do not play along with visual or auditory disturbances. If possible, involve trusted family members and be prepared to spend time at the scene. These and that last one right there, be prepared to spend time at the scene. Dispatch is probably going to be calling. Can you pick up? Can you pick up? Can you pick up? We don't want to be rude to dispatch, but we also want to um, help them to understand that you know it, it's going to take a little bit of time for us to to get done what we need to get done. Now, don't don't milk it and be out there forever, but um, you take your time. Take your time with these people. 
Never leave the patient alone. Um, avoid the use of restraints if you can. Don't force the patient to make decisions. Get the patient to engage in motor activity. Disperse any crowd which gathered um, for a couple reasons. HIPAA, two, it's none of their business. Three, um, it could make the patient more agitated. So, and, and if you have a problem dispersing the crowd, then who are you going to call? The police. Uh, have a pre-planned and clear route to an exit. And don't, don't ever let the patient block you either. Um, if you need to leave, you need to know that the door's right there. There's no one blocking it. There's nothing blocking it. And I can get out of that house, okay? Or get out of where I'm at because um, if, as soon as that patient flips the script on you, then you got to go. Scene is not safe. All right. Um, case study. Colby kneels down near the patient who is sitting on the ground. I'm Colby. I want to help you. Tell me what's going on. Meanwhile, Nancy learns from the patient's friend that he has a drinking problem, but he has not been able to get alcohol for two to three days. I think it's the DTs, the friend says. I've seen it before. It looks like the DTs. So if we go back to chapter 22, we know that the DTs are delirium tremens. Something we should already know. Um, what consideration should Colby and Nancy give to, give to the information received from the patient's friend? And what steps should the EMTs take in the assessment and management of this patient? So take a few seconds to, um, to process th this in your mind. And write your answers down and see if they get see if you um, see if those answers come up um, or see if your these questions get answered later on in the PowerPoint. Go back. One thing you want to notice here is that one EMT kneels down near the patient. He gets at his level. He says, I want to help you. Please tell me what's going on. While he's doing the interview, his partner is getting a history. All right. Assessment-based approach. Doing your scene size up. Behavioral emergencies can be unpredictable and volatile. Remember, just because a scene is safe when you get there doesn't mean it cannot become unsafe. Uh, do not enter a dangerous situation without law enforcement support. Be aware of dangers associated with a patient's choice of mechanisms for suicide. Uh, if they tell you knife, gun, razor blade, you need to be looking for a knife, gun, or razor blade. Um, one good idea is to use the plus one rule. When I was a policeman, I used the plus one rule. If, they, if I did not see a knife or a gun, I always added one. Uh, one that I could not see just in case they were hiding one. So that's always a good, um, that'll keep you on your toes. Not necessarily a fear factor, but if fear keeps you safe and keeps you alive, then let's use it. Um, locate the patient before entering the scene. Don't be walking through the house blindly in the sight patient because they might jump out of the closet on you or come around the corner behind you, that sort of thing. And you don't want to have that kind of uh, situation where you're having to fight your way out of the house. Scan for objects that could be used as weapons. Scan for items that could be used in a suicide attempt. I mean, if you go into a, uh, a house and you're looking around and this person's attempt, wanting to attempt suicide or he has homicidal ideations and they're in the kitchen with a bunch of butcher knives and sharp objects, well, start moving those things away. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Rearrange, just like you have to rearrange furniture for seizures or you have to rearrange furniture for um, uh, getting a stretcher in the house. Well, you move that stuff out of the way if it's a danger to you. And uh, do not assume that there's only one patient. I think that's self-explanatory. All right. He's visually located the patient before he approaches. Um, look for any weapons. I'm just going to be honest with you from experience. Uh, that EMT is way too close. It ain't going to take but a few steps for that guy to get to him. And he turns around and runs. He's going to take his eyes off the patient, and the patient's going to beat him with that stick. So I think that's a little too close, folks. Okay. Maybe this is an example of what not to do. This is a good idea. During your primary, formulate a general impression, assess the mental status, assess the airway and breathing, control bleeding, and assess for shock. Uh, obtain a history in your secondary. Be polite and respectful. Respect the patient's privacy. Uh, use active listening. Use open-ended questions. 
So when, when we obtain a history, we're talking about a sample, no PQRST. Don't want, let's not forget those. It's going to get you on your assessments and your scenarios if you forget that. Suicidal patients, when performing an assessment on a patient who has attempted or threatened suicide, keep additional guidelines in mind. For violent patients, take a history, look at the patient's posture, listen to the patient, monitor the patient's physical activity, be firm and clear, be prepared to use restraints, but only if necessary. Signs and symptoms to be looking for in your secondary psychiatric emergencies, fear, anxiety, confusion, behavioral changes, anger, mania, uh, depression, withdrawal, loss of contact with reality, sleeplessness, change in appetite, loss of sex drive, constipation, crying. Uh, emergency medical care. Um, this is going to be repeated for all your patients uh, in the future. Um, for all specific um, medical emergencies, uh, maintain your own safety, assess for trauma or med and medical conditions, calm the patient and stay with them. Uh, if needed to protect yourself or others or the patient from harm, use restraints, transport to a facility where he can get the care needed. Um, reassessment, reassesses, uh, reassess as warranted by the patient's condition. Continue to calm and reassure. All right, restraining the patient. If you believe the patient is a, is a danger to himself or others, contact law enforcement. Use restraints only for a patient who is a, a danger to himself or others. Seek medical direction and follow protocols. Do not restrain a patient in a prone position. Uh, and this is going to go back to the agitated delirium or excited delirium and putting pressure on that respiratory system where they can't breathe. Their hands are behind their back and um, or their hands are not free to help them push up and get off their thoracic cavity. Uh, gather enough people to overpower the patient before you attempt restraint. Plan your activities before you attempt restraint. Use only as much force as needed for restraint. Estimate the range of motion of the patient's arms and legs. After you have made the decision to restrain, act quickly. One rescuer should talk to the patient throughout the restraining process. Uh, approach the patient with at least four rescuers at the same time. Um, if you have that resource, then that would be great. Uh, secure the patient with the equipment pro uh, approved by medical direction. Secure the patient to the stretcher in a supine position, remember not the prone, with multiple straps. If the patient is spitting on rescuers, cover his face with a disposable surgical mask. Reassess airway and breathing uh, frequently. After you have applied restraints, do not remove them. Let the hospital do that. Okay. Restraining combative patient. Um, I don't know, guys. I mean... He says, "Identify and let your patient identify yourself and let your patient know what to expect." Uh, if he's combative, well, he's going to be combative. I mean, I don't know how. I don't know how. I don't know how it's going to work out. You're probably going to have to have more help than this. I'm just going to be honest with you. Now, he, this to me, looking at this picture, this patient is complying. He might not want to, but. He seems to be complying. I just don't see this going very well if he is combative. Um, create a safe zone. Wait for police if you have to. That would probably be my my biggest advice to you. And uh, follow your local protocols. I mean, you, you may know some self-defense or some uh, defensive tactics or anything like that. And you might be able to take do takedown maneuvers. But that's not in your protocol. It's not in your um, scope of practice. So if you do something like that and you hurt somebody... Um, I don't, I don't know the, I can't predict the outcome, but I would uh, probably go ahead and predict the, that you're going to have a lawsuit on your hands at least. So the police, that's, that's what they're known for. That's what they train to do every day. So, um, call them out there and let them, uh, take this patient down if you can. Okay. Um, never restrain a, a patient in a prone position. Uh, you see that they're, they're, they're going to be tying down his feet here with, um, uh, soft restraints, uh, triangular bandages. Um, you see his arms right there are cr crisscrossed 
across his uh, chest cavity, uh, along with, uh, and, and they're still using uh, triangular bandages. Like I said, this patient looks really, really calm. It looks like he's he's complying, and um, not as combative as they uh, as they would uh, as they said earlier. So, uh, consent. Um, and it, let me just before I go any further, let me go back. You know, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Each situation is going to dictate itself uh, differently. So you need to um, use your best judgment and don't be afraid to call uh, law enforcement um, and maybe the fire department if they're there to help you already. I wouldn't call them out there specifically to help you restrain a patient. But if they're there already, then um, definitely ask them to help. All right. Consent. Patients who are unresponsive or, or, or not competent to consent may be treated under implied consent. We've already talked about consent before. Uh, it's very important that you use consent. Um, consent principles can be difficult to apply in the case of a patient suffering a psychiatric emergency. Consult medical direction and carefully follow your local protocols. Refusal. Competent patients can refuse care. Uh, if a patient threatens to harm himself or others, you may be able to transport without consent. That is going to be that emergency committal. Um, we don't want to, if a patient threatens to hurt himself or other people uh, in our presence, we do not want to leave them on scene. It may have to go with law enforcement, but we need to have that, we need to have that patient uh, sent to the hospital to be evaluated. Uh, document the situation, use direct quotes. Involve, and what, it, what that means is when you write your report, um, don't, don't reword anything that the patient said quote them quote unquote in the um in your report uh, even if it's foul language and you might not like using foul language yourself but you're gonna have to document what they said um so that so that whoever reads that report whether it be um an auditor or a lawyer or, or law enforcement or anything like that they get a very very clear idea of what happened okay uh involve law enforcement if you need to and follow your local protocols um, using reasonable force, the minimum amount of force required to keep the patient from injuring himself or others. Um, you know, patients, psych patients may say things that are going to, in, in an attempt to offend you and, and get you upset. Uh, you got to let that stuff roll off your back. So, and with that being said, if you get mad, don't be tying a patient down so tight, you know, that you're hurting them just because they, they mouthed off to you. Okay. Um, put on the tough skin and, and do your job and do it right. Uh, the amount of force depends on the situation. You know, they're, they're wrestling with you and you gotta, gotta get on top of them on the stretcher to get them down. And that's what you gotta do. You know, when you get them, get them restrained and you get off of them. All right. Um, and involve law enforcement and follow your local protocol, man. That's what, you know, I hate to say that's what cops are, are meant for, but they, that's what they, they're there to protect. And if it's in, gotta, if they gotta get in the back of that ambulance with you to keep that patient calm and help you restrain them, then that's what they'll do. Trust me. Um, I, I did it for 12 years and, and we were more than happy to assist EMS whenever it came to, um, combative patients. Uh, police and medical direction. Before you restrain any patient for any reason, seek medical direction. Law enforcement personnel should be involved when you need to restrain a patient or transport without consent or if there's any threat of violence. So read that again so that you know it. Law enforcement can help protect you from injury and they can serve as credible witnesses if needed. Nothing better than having a policeman or as a witness to a patient hitting you or trying to hit you or, or witnessing, you know, you having to restrain a patient and then they, you know, say they say they were calm and cool and they don't know why they got restrained and then there's, a policeman who was there could definitely uh, is an expert on the use of force and could um, be a witness in your corner. False accusations document carefully and completely because that's what people do. They're crazy. They will accuse you falsely and to get you in trouble, get you fired. Um, I have been a victim of that and it's not, it's not fun. Uh, document the patient's behavior and statements, have witnesses if possible, Use providers that are the same gender as the patient, if you can. Uh, sometimes females don't want to talk to males, so if you have a female that can help you, then call them. If not, then, you know, it is what it is. 
All right, case study conclusion. Kobe questions the patient about his perception that spiders are crawling on him. He says, I know you may have, you may see and feel spiders, but there aren't any spiders on you, she says. What you are seeing is because of a medical problem. So she's explaining to him exactly what's going on, okay? Uh, the patient is calmed a little by Kobe's reassurances, but still is agitated and disoriented. Colby performs a physical exam and obtains baseline vital signs and a blood glucose level before transport to the hospital. In the history, she is able to confirm that the patient is usually a heavy drinker, but that he has not had a drink for two days. The patient denies a history of other medical problems as well as taking any medical medications or other drugs. En route, he occasionally uh, experiences hallucinations that he is covered in spiders. Well aware of the potential for serious side effects from alcohol withdrawal, Kobe reassesses the patient's mental status and vital signs every 15 minutes. Now, I know they were probably calling this patient stable, but I'm probably going to reassess a little bit quicker than 15 minutes, maybe 5 to 10. That's just personal preference for me. You do what you want to do. Uh, at the hospital, the patient is diagnosed and treated for alcohol withdrawal. He is then uh, admitted to an inpatient psychiatric facility for completion of alcohol of an alcohol treatment program. All right. So that's it for psychiatric emergencies. Um, remember, psychiatric emergencies may result from a psychiatric disorder or from a medical or traumatic condition. So psychiatric emergency can place EMTs at risk. Physical restraint is only used when the patient is a threat to himself or others. Behavioral emergencies can involve legal issues of consent and refusal of consent. That being said, if you have any questions you need to review, you can always email me any of your questions at regionaltraining46 at gmail.com. Or you can just rewind this video and uh, look back over it. I will put the PowerPoint slides in the classroom for you to review as well. And we'll see you next time.